until there's a sufficient anointing. And I, we don't ever know when it's going to be, do we? When suddenly you're, we're sitting in a sanctuary and suddenly there's this feeling like, I know the Lord wants to heal people. So you expect the charismatic healing line. You want somebody to be the hot nut of the show, like the, the star, the superstar, and take my jacket off and throw it on them. And they fall down because I've sweated up and stunk it up, you know, and not because it's anointed. Seriously, we need to be delivered from that stuff. It's just junk. It's junk because God wants the oil to flow through you. No show, no big time, no, go down there where Baldwin's at. You can really get some stuff down there. No, sitting right next to you. And you say, well, I don't really know how to do that. You're perfect. Just sit with him and get the oil. And you're sitting beside somebody who physically is maimed or whatever her, hers or his situation may be. And you look to them and just simply say, would you mind if I would pray with you? Worship's going on. Or... Maybe I'm preaching, you do it, and when he finishes, when we go take communion, can I pray with you? And God, boom, because you're full of the oil. That's the way the kingdom works. Encouraging People presents Harvest Time with Pastor Bill Baldwin. Well, he's a Pentecostal. I'm a Methodist, but anyway, it's good to be here with you. <laughs> I ain't no kidding. I... <laughs> Kind of, sort of, but whatever. We, we, it all comes out in the end, don't it? I mean, you know. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Mm -mm -mm. Well, <laughs> I, uh, this morning, the, um, the word I have for you, it, 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 it to say it down to earth in southern lingo, it ain't nothing like what I thought I was going to do. <clears throat> the Lord started messing with me. Um, actually, it's not, if when I, when I finish, if you sit there and say, I think I understood it, but I'm not sure, then that's close. That's close enough. <laughs> because this past Monday, just in my time with the Lord, I... Um, now, I want to preface this to say this because this is the last time I'll talk about the uh, eclipse that's going to happen tomorrow. I, had, I forgot about all that. going. I, did, I didn't even have that in mind, that, you know, the eclipse is coming and all the... Did you know... Did, some of you, did you know we was having an eclipse? Yeah, okay. I, I saw Wes go, <laughs> I don't want you left in the dark. No pun intended. <sighs> this is supposed to be a real serious message now. Come on. Um, seriously. Um, I, had, I didn't even think about that. I mean, I knew it, but, and I saw all the, and I'm not a typical end timeser, you know, eschatological last days guy. I mean, I believe in all of that. I just, you don't hear me talk about it a lot. So that was on the back shelf. It wasn't even an issue. And I just started reading, reading scriptures. And, and the Lord took me, um, I mean, I was just reading through Matthew chapter 24. And with the intent of getting to where I felt like I was supposed to read was in Matthew chapter 25, which that whole bunch of scripture, that chapter 24, starting with chapter 24, all the way through chapter 25, it's all about the, the, uh, the, the end of the age. The whole thing is about that. So it doesn't stop in chapter 24, but it's one of these double prophecy things. It's, <clears throat> it's not just about the end of the age as uh, we know it in our time, but it was about the end of the age as they knew it as disciples in their time. And I'll explain that in a moment. So let's just, let's just read the Bible and I'll talk and we'll see what comes out, okay? Matthew chapter 24. So Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to a point, came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them and said, you see all these? Do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As far as we know, they're walking past, they look, and they are all, you know, basically bragging on their temple. Nothing wrong with that. And it's, it's not an ugly brag. It's just the 
wow, look at, look at this. Jesus stops right there, and we don't know what they do, but there's a pause after that verse until we get to verse 3. And then it comes to verse 3, and they have moved on, and it says, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately because he had said to them, everything you see is going to be thrown to the ground. It's all going to be gone. So immediately they're thinking, uh, they're thinking this is the, the end of something's getting ready to take place. And they were, they were very aware of these end time things as, as Jews, as Hebrews. So verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your, here's a key word, coming? Actually, the Lord got my attention with this because I started thinking about going back to my old seminary days, back in Methodist school. <laughs> I started thinking about the word parousia. Anybody ever heard that word? That it's a Greek word. Can you say it out loud? Parousia. I've got the interpretation of that right now. <laughs> Just kidding. It's, it's, a, it's a Greek word that means coming. But there's several words in the Greek text that means coming, that's, been, that's used for coming. But when you talk about and hear the word parousia, some pronounce it parousia, but parousia, when you hear that, it's a different kind of coming because it is a coming that is forever coming until he comes. It's not, like, um, it's not like I say, well, I heard Robert's coming today, and here he is. That's a different kind of coming. He was coming, and boom, and we note his location right there on that road. This coming is, is that he's coming, and his coming shall unfold over a period of time. And it will actually reveal itself differently with each unfolding as he comes. For example, I, uh, I think about moves of God that I think in the past. Um, maybe the last major revival. Oh, well, let's just go back to Asbury a few uh, years or so ago, a year ago, a little over a year ago when I went there to Asbury. And the, Lord, and the Lord came, and the presence of the Lord came in that old chapel, seat 1,500 people. Well, the Lord came, but it was... That was just one more part of his coming that he is unveiling until he finally, until he finally comes. So it's that, that's basically, that's what it is. He says, so tell us, when will all this begin to unfold? When will be your coming? And he goes on verse 4. And it's amazing that Jesus, the next words he says is this. See to it that no one leads you astray. Make sure nobody deceives you. Because at that point, deception is key. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ, they'll lead many astray. And you'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are but the beginning of birth pains. In other words, it's going to be a normal thing to take place. And this is not a message about the second coming of Jesus. I just want to say that again. I didn't say that plainly, so if I, there it is. Verse 9. Then he says, and here's where it gets, and we, and we American Christians don't know, we don't have a shelf to set this verse on. But I'm wondering if one's not being built. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. The word tribulation is not the great tribulation. It simply means pressure, affliction, distress, anguish, to be confined, to be troubled. It was the same thing in, in Hebrews. If you read the, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, and I said this so many times that when they what wrote the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews was written to encourage those Jewish Christians from falling away because they were going back to Judaism because the stress on them for following Jesus was getting was getting, but becoming enormous. So that the whole book was written for that re reason. So he says, they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations. I want you to just listen to that right there. Again, we're not quite ready for this kind of result of the gospel because we've been taught, believe in Jesus and you'll be blessed. And we categorize what that looks like. 
It looks like, you know, a three-bedroom home, two bath on a couple acres, and everything looks good, and everybody likes you, and da-da-da-da. That has been our, that's been what we've kind of used for, for that. But it says here, Jesus said, you'll be put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations, by all people groups. Nations is not governments. Nations is people groups. Never, you, and you know it too, never seen the time in my life when I had a, had a friend to call me uh, yesterday, no, Friday, Friday at 4.30, and conversation got to the place to where I could sense the tension because of our differences. And I hang up the phone. Of course, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, you know, this, th- that, and that was simple. This thing could be on the edge before it's over with. But, so you'll be hated by all people groups, nations, for my na- because of me, Jesus is saying. And many will fall away, and many will betray one another and hate one another. Hate, hate one another. I mean, just, you, all you have to do is do the politic thing on this one. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray because lawlessness will increase. The love of many will grow cold. But the one, and here it is, and here's the sign of the one who knows the Lord. Again, not real American, but real Bible. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. You mean we got to hang in there for this one? The one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will parousia. It will, it will come. Now, I'm going to pick up and read them in a few minutes, but let me just stop here. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm dancing through this, so I'm just going to admit it right now. So I, it's just, there it is. Jesus, there's a double prophecy because in a, 30, in a little over 30 years from this point, Rome is going to lay siege to Jerusalem and they're, and they're going to destroy the whole city. In 70 AD, it took place. It happened. The fall of Jerusalem is well known. Um, it, it's historical. I, I, Wikipedia's got plenty about it. Just go there and look. Josephus, who was a historian of the time, he wrote this, and I, and I, I didn't know this, obviously, so I'm uh, reading um, Josephus wrote, listen to this, 1.1 million people, the majority of them Jewish, were kill, killed during the siege. A death toll he attributes to the celebration, which it was time of the Passover when they came in. Josephus goes on to report that after the Romans killed the, the, killed the armed and elderly people, 97,000 were enslaved. He records, Josephus records, he's the historian, records that many people were sold into slavery and that of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, 40,000 individuals survived and the emperor finally let some of them go, it says. Now skip on down just a little. It it got so bad there that uh, what Rome did, they cut their their supply line off and they intend on starving them. And some of them did. And even uh, some uh, some of the historians said that they came to the place of cannibalism, eating one another, or at least the, the dead bodies. Drop down a little farther in chapter 24. I haven't even got where I want to talk about yet today, so let's just read. Um, maybe verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as the days, For as were the days of Noah, so telling here, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. How was the days of Noah? Let's just get real practical here. The days of Noah was like this. God spoke to Noah. Noah took the, took the, the, the orders, the command, how to build the, the ark. And over a period of time, 120 years, he built the ark. Then the rain came. And then the rain came over a period of 40 days. This coming was unfolding. Do you see that? Just like um, the, it was a parousia coming. For in those days, the flood were, and in, in they before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, just like today, until the day when Noah entered the ark, 
and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all the way. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And the key verse is in verse 44, which kind of wraps all this chapter up right here. Therefore, you also must be ready, or the word is prepared. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour. There the word is again, parousia. He is coming at an hour you don't expect. And I think it like this. I think that the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to reveal himself at a moment when you least expect it. Some years ago, I was, uh, I, I, I related this to somebody, and it might have been you, so forgive me if I tell stories two or three weeks straight in a row, but, you know, when you talk a lot like I do, you forget who you're talking to. But I was in a, I was in a men's gathering at the church we were at, and, and the men, and I was making some phone calls, and, the, and I said, you guys go ahead and start worshiping. It was sort of like what we did uh, uh, last month, you know, got together, and I mean, but at this point, we'd been doing this a long time together, and I mean, they were, they were going, I could hear them coming through the walls, you know, 30 so men in there just worshiping the Lord. Well, I was in the next, I was in the office making phone calls to people who had visited the Sunday before, and finally I got finished with my little tedious things, my administrative stuff, you know, and so I walked in the door, and by this time, they're still singing. By this time, the presence of God was so strong which I didn't expect. <laughs> I'm not bad. I didn't, ex- I didn't expect like, whoa, you know, you guys carrying the stuff. Uh, I walked in and the presence of the Lord was so strong, I didn't know I had come from a world of, hey, how you doing? It, yeah, this Bill Baldwin. Oh, appreciate you being there yesterday. Yeah, it was good to have you. You know, that kind of thing. And I walked into a group of men who were worshiping to the place. I didn't even know. How, I couldn't do nothing but stand there. I was not ready for it. I just stood there until I could get, I could work the rest of myself into the moment. And when the Lord says this, be ready, we've got this idea that the only kind of ready is, is that, you know, the, the, uh, the movie, what's the, the, or the books, left behind thing, you know, boom, everybody's gone, ready for that. Well, if that's what happens, what happens. But that's not what I, I don't, I don't even think that. Here's what I'm thinking, is that Jesus is going to have, his coming is so unfolding, is that he is preparing us for moments when he will come. And he's looking and saying also in those moments, are you ready? Do you understand what I'm saying? Or am I just kind of like barking up a weird tree? Are are you ready for that? Or are we so out of tune, are we so out of tune out here is that when that moment comes, you know, we've prayed for years. God, we want revival. We want a move of God. We've got to have it. Our nation has got to have a move of God. And I'm thinking there will be so few people ready for that because once it, once the Spirit of the Lord begins to move. You've got to be willing to steward that thing. He's not going to waste heaven and the presence of the Lord on a people who just want a great Sunday morning service. Do you understand? And this, and if and if you if you get anything this morning, get this. It's going to require more our mindset of life and walking with the Lord and church life, it has to shift. We cannot continue to, man, I had a good crowd today. It's a good, good, yeah, we, yeah, it's a good crowd today. I don't measure it even by, I just, this morning, I mean, I kept my meter for, where's the Lord at? Where's the Lord at? And when I found a little spot where I could grab hold of that, let's grab it and pull that down. And that has, to be, that has to be our thrust. So the Lord, when he, when he says these things, therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to have those designated moments when 
boom, he comes. And if you're not ready, you'll completely miss it. And some might look at it like, you know, the old saying, a cow looking at a new gate. Like, what be this? So, with all of that in the background, and that's where we are, this whole thing still continues, but it changes. The whole story, Jesus' emphasis, uh, it's the same but different. It's almost now, and this is what challenges me. And I don't know that I don't know that I do it good, but I'm going to give it a shot because it's all I got. And at this point, he's getting ready to talk about us, not just about everybody generally in the world, but a select group of us. And I want to read the next 13 verses, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, where he talks about 10 virgins. He says, then, so this is carrying on. And personally, I think chapter 24 includes pretty much the whole realm of things, the cosmos. Chapter 25, he says specifically, then the kingdom of heaven is going to be like this. Do you, do you see the difference? He's, this, I'm, going, he said, I'm just going to talk about the kingdom of heaven for a while. And he talks about that here, and he continues through the, through the chapter. <clears throat> you're looking at me like you're getting it, but I'm assuming you are. If you do, let me know so I can get it. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. The kingdom, that's us. Will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. There's that. Now, you got to realize something. People back in this day talking about midnight, midnight was midnight for them. I mean, it's not like you. Like, well, I finally got into bed at 10 or 30 or something like that. No, no. they go to bed when the sun goes down back in those days. So it was in the middle of sleep at midnight. It was an unexpected moment. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Verse 7. Then all those virgins, all those virgins, the whole kingdom, trimmed, rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy Buy for yourself. Get your own. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. And afterwards, the, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I, this, this is, a, this is a, another telling statement from the Lord. I do not know you. Let me pause because I remember something I said some years ago is that a lot of people say we, I remember coming up in, uh, as when I came to the Lord, I was saved, and I literally, I was, I was raised in, the, well, I wasn't raised in church, but I went to a Methodist church, and I was a Methodist pastor for a while in the beginning, and when all that happened, I remember my church world, my, my Methodist world, which I love them, but we talked about if they were truly born again, that, they, that we had a relationship with Jesus. And, and now I kind of see that different because sometimes now I think we can be introduced to Jesus but have no relationship. If you can be married to a woman or a man and be married but have no relationship, you can be introduced to the Savior. I'm a sinner. You're a Savior. I confess my sins, but never carry on knowing, knowing. So Jesus looked and he said, I don't, 
I don't think I, I don't know you. I don't know you. And this verse 13, they say, was added later. The early church, they say, added this or later in, in the text, but it still works. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor, nor the hour. This whole thing of the hour that we're in, the time that we live in is, is huge. I mean, it's like crazy huge. I, I've, never, I've never seen a moment. Uh, in fact, Jesus mentioned that one time, says, pay attention because there's coming the, um, hold on, I'll find it. Verse 15, I didn't read it. So he said, Jesus is telling them, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and if you'll go back and see what that is, basically <coughs> Antiochus, who was a Seleucid king, came in and just desecrated the temple and took over the temple and set up a statue of Zeus, uh, offered pigs on the altar, which was an un the most unclean thing they could have done uh, back in that day. And they called that the, the abomination of desolation. They desecrated the temple in the place of the Lord. I mean, has there ever been a time, and I'm trying to keep this not political, but boy, it sure is hard, is there ever been a time when politicians have just desecrated with, at least with words, the ways of God? And it's been so desecrating that now things like abortion, that's like political. We, we assume, we, we, we it's for so many years now, we check that off as a political thing. Now, I know if you don't, I, I don't either, but hear what I'm saying we tend to do that because it's become a liberal, conservative thing. It's not murder or, you know, a safe haven for children. It is, it's become a thing of political persuasion. It's a desecration of human life is what it is. But we don't kind of like, we don't do that much anymore. But we've gotten so used to that, now we've moved to other levels to the point now, I don't see, I don't know if there will be a turning back. Hope, I want it to. Because now it's the, you know, the transgender thing, change the gender of, of children of nothing. Of children, our kids. And then declaring what, what was the most holy, I'm all in now, so let me just go on. What was the Easter Sunday? I'm already there now. Hey, the most holy day of the year, the president of the United States declared it visibility transgender day. And I'm thinking, you're nuts. You don't realize you, you can, and I'm thinking of him. You can get away with this for a season, Bob. But there will come a day if you don't take advantage of this season of repentance and that's what you're in, what he's in, what he's, whatever. What you're in, like he's going to see this. <laughs> if he doesn't take advantage of it, he will, he will one day stand before the one that he desecrated. For you're no longer just desecrating a building now. You're desecrating the very waves of a holy God. And you might get away with it for a while and you might be able to kill some of us and slaughter some of us and put us to the side and cut us off and we might starve and all that kind of stuff. We might do that. That might happen. And you might think you got the upper hand, but one day we will have the robes and you will stand before the one that you desecrated. And it will be scary and I don't say this as a gotcha. I say it as, listen, thank God we're not there yet, but there is no longer, it's almost like there is no wavering anymore. There is no, there is no slack on either side. So the Lord says, now watch this. 
in this time, when this season's going on, and when the, when the coming of the Lord, the comings of the Lord are taking place and being lined up, the kingdom, that's us, is going to be like, going to be like virgins, 10 of them. Five are wise, five are foolish. And you know, I mean, we don't have to go deep into it. Listen, you're smart enough to figure this out. Virgins, come on. Moral purity, goodness, 10 maidens ready to, the, their whole purpose is to welcome the bridegroom. And all 10 have been given by grace, and I never saw this until, honestly, this morning early, been given by grace the necessary things they need to do their job as part of the kingdom and to be who they are. All 10 have the equipment. They just, as Jesus opened up, they just have it, which means it's given to them by grace. They didn't produce it. They had their lamps, had it all, which is torches, actually it's a torch. And this is a picture of a Jewish, ancient Jewish wedding where there would be 10 maidens and the whole thing is, is that the bride would be here and they would await the bridegroom's arrival to pick up the bride who was with the other, with her maidens, her maidens of honor. And when the bridegroom, they would say, come out, the bridegroom's here. And all the maidens would go out and then he would fetch his bride and probably sweep her up on the horse and, or whatever and put her on the back of the camel and here they'd go, you know. And they, and they would go down to his house. And that was the beginning of the, the marriage ceremony. And, and the ten maidens were happy to be a part of that celebration. All of that came, all the equipment, all that they had. The fact that they are maidens. They were chosen. Has any of you women in here, girls, or at one time, or you're a woman now, but you were a girl, but whatever. Shut up, Bill. <laughs> you're getting an age stuff there. You've been a maid, maid of honor in a wedding. How, how many ladies have ever been maid of honor? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. You got that. They ask you to be that. You didn't say, can I be one of them? They, most of the time, I guess, they ask you to be that. You were chosen. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you. Listen to these words. I chose you and appointed you, John 15, 16. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide. The fact that the maidens were there is the grace of God. And I, and I, I struggle with this because I've, a few weeks ago, I don't look at those videos very much uh, that the that, going on here, but I, the other week I did, and I saw the one where I was all excited about, you know, it is nothing we do, it is all him, and it's still true, but yet all truth, and we've got to walk with this, if you don't walk with truth in a tension, you will lose it, and you will lose the impact of it. Did, eh, I ain't got no acoustic out, or I'd explain. If you take the tension off a guitar string, and try to play it, it just flop, blah, blah, it doesn't do anything. But you, you tune it and you bring tension on both ends. Both ends are necessary. It's the same way in the scripture. We are saved not by our performance. You can't perform well enough to be right with Jesus. And that is a yay, yay. At the same time, and, he, and this is not a bad move. This is not a sneaky move like, yeah, you're getting in by grace and now we're going to slap you around and make you walk by works. No, 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 no. We have been chosen as part of a kingdom to usher in the glorious king, not just for the second coming where he takes us out, but for the comings. Listen, our nation needs a coming of Jesus in it. Our town, our city needs a... Our homes, our church needs a coming, a parousia, a coming of the Lord in it, where the presence of God comes. But he always sends ahead of that group, if you will, virgins who are playing their part. They're, 
Their chosenness was from the Lord. It's grace. Their virtue, which was a reflection of who he is in their life, it was totally the thing of the Lord. They're, they were equipped by the Lord. Didn't say they went and got their lamps. They just had them. They had their torch. They came from God. They had all the equipment they needed. That was, that was totally from the Lord. And then we got down to this one issue. There came the moment when the Lord wanted to show up and his presence, and that is actually parousia, actually has another meaning, which actually means presence. His presence wanted to be among the people. Five of them were wise enough to get oil ahead. Now, now hear me. You listen to me. I'm going to spiritualize this, and if you don't like that kind of preaching, then <laughs> I'm sorry. Five were wise enough to get oil because the general, a lot of times we can do a lot of fluff over. Yeah, I know the Lord. I've known the Lord since I was 13 years old. I've known the Lord since when I was 25, I can take you to the, all that's good, but that's lamps. And it's good. Thank the Lord for that. I was on my, my college Stadium and listen to an evangelist, 50 yard line. That's good, but that's a lamp. Because something different is required of me today. I can't step up here before you and just give you, listen, I can preach that which is true, but no, have no anointing on truth. Do you understand? There's a difference. Having anointing on truth requires oil not just correct biblical interpretation. So you've got these, you've got these, these virgins and five are ready and five are not. You can't tell the difference in them on the outside. Just like I can't tell the difference in some of you on the outside. Some of you, yeah, but others, no, I'm not just kidding. Now, I can't tell that we can't look at one another on the outside. It is only when the Lord comes, we become a reflection of what's on the inside. So these five in that moment <clears throat> look to the five that's got the goods and say, give us some of yours. Now, I'm going to mess with this, and I know and I'm going down paths I am not really sure of, but it feels good, so just let me walk down it and see how it works. I can draw off of you for a long time, and you can draw off of me. In other words, I come to church, and I'm not in a mood to worship. That's bad when you're the preacher and you're that way, but that does happen. I'm not in a mood to worship, but I get around a bunch of you who are, and like you create a, a wave that I don't have, so I just catch yours and I surf on yours a while. And that's okay until you're not around. Or until you, you are put in a position to where you know you need to produce for those around you, and they don't have, a, and you know they don't have a clue of what's going on in, in terms of spiritual reality, and you ain't got me to draft on, or or Brian or whoever. At that moment, you got to have your own oil, and you cannot, according to the Scripture, according to the Word, and according to what Jesus said. I can't look over here to Debbie and say, Debbie, give me some of what you got. I don't understand this completely, but I want to say this much. There is what we call and has been called in the charismatic slash neo-Pentecostal, whatever you call what we are, uh, impartation. And I've been part of that. It's real. Yeah, it is real. Some about this is deeper to where you come up and say, I want you to pray so I'll get me some of that. Listen, 
if I've sown, if I've sown hours in the morning setting to get to know the one who wants to know me, I can't lay my hands on you and give you in five seconds what it took me five hours to get a hold of. And furthermore, I don't even know, I'm sometimes because of my own humanity, and I'm real human, because of my own humanity, I don't even feel like I've got anything until I need it. And at that moment, I go down and the parousia, the Lord shows up and boom, it comes right, I mean, it comes bubbling up that, you know, that the, the, the Beverly Hillbillies, that bubbling crude, you know, comes up out of, out of the inside. You didn't know it was there. So here it is. What is, what is this? What is this thing? Because suddenly, watch this. You got to hear this. Everything was free except the oil. I want to say that again real clearly. And the oil, by the way, is, is the part that we know as the anointing of the Lord, the unction of God. Everything was free. They didn't get the lamps. They didn't have to buy the lamp. They didn't do nothing. They, just, they were just there. They had kept their life pure. God had helped them with all of that. But when it got down to the nitty gritty, there are five in the kingdom that were not prepared to usher in the presence that was to come. You see, I, I don't know how else to say this because I'm in it so deep. Let me just go ahead and get out there and just tell you. You, you, we got, if you want to be a nominal Christian, you, you probably, if, if things continue going the way they're going in our nation with the pressure and the tribulation that's coming, you won't even be a one. You, you will think you are, but the pressure, and you're going to, I know, I get it, my theology too. Bill, what about grace? I know, I got it, I got it. What about, you said you don't have to perform. You don't. But what are you saying? I know. My point is this. Why do you want to push it? Why do you want to challenge the tension? Just let the tension do its work because God's trying to draw you near to his heart because, watch this, these virgins who are there together, watch it, listen to this, it's not about them. It's not about, I just want to come to church today because I just need to be lifted up. And that's okay. I hope you are. I really do. I do too a lot of times. A lot of times. But there comes a point where I realize the kingdom of heaven, Jesus saying, in the, when I'm planning to come and in the kingdom of heaven, it looks like this. And we've only covered one aspect of it. We'll have time for others, but... Why, why, why don't people have oil? The, the, anoint, the anointing, if you go to the scripture, uh, I don't, I, I'm not going to go deep into this, but um, I think it's Genesis 20 uh, something, eight, Genesis 28, first, the first uh, spoken word about oil was when God showed up to Jacob and um, you, know, you saw the angels up and down called it Bethel, and he took oil and poured it on the rock. It happened again the next time. It happened again in chapter 30-something, Genesis, same book. Happened again. I took him away and told him to go back to Bethel. I don't know if you remember the story, but he went back to Bethel. The Lord showed up, did the same thing, poured oil on the rock. He anointed the place. Why is this pouring oil? Because oil, listen to this, oil is one of the most expensive commodities of the ancient world. They would barter and sell. It, it, was a, it was even a means of currency in some places. Oil mixed with certain kinds of uh, frankincense and scents. Oil was, was what they used to, to anoint kings and to anoint the, the, the tabernacle, the temple. Oil had this sanctifying property about it. And any... any Time anyone or anything had oil poured on it, it was set apart 
as an object blessed of God. Oil, to say it another way, was extremely, hear me, expensive. Let me say it one more way, and I think I've got my point across. It's all by grace, but if you want to carry the anointing for what's coming, and God wants you to, you cannot look to me and say, well, you're the preacher. That's right, and I just did my job. I told you that you need to carry the anointing. I've, do, I've done what I, my calls to do is to tell you you can only carry the anointing for your place and for your part and for your kids. The anointing on your household, over your children, it's up to you. Don't just hope, I hope they turn out all right. Well, they probably won't if that's your attitude. And if you will have this, do you do know when I say oil, I'm not, I don't mean literal. I'm speaking spiritual, figurative here. Let me say it just plain. What Jesus suddenly talks about will cost you something. And I want to be just as plain as I can to say this. It burdens me to the core when I sometimes sense that some of the virgins, that's the kingdom, that's us, if we think that, well, you know, that's just not me. That's you, but that's not, that's not me. Uh, we have all got to find our place in the midst of hearing Jesus say, to know me, to really know me will require something of you. There's going to be people don't that, that I'm already getting pretty plain spoken. So they're, they're going to go to hell if we don't get our oil on us. Because until I have paid the price to carry that, the reality of his presence, I don't care. I mean, I just don't care. That's sad, ain't it? I don't care where they go or not. I, I won't get my bread and get out and go home and eat my sandwich. I don't care about them. I mean, I do, but I don't. You know, you probably the same way. But when I have known him and when I have sat with him and when he is real, takes your heart and just undoes it. And you don't even know what you, you don't know what you're squalling for. You don't even know what's going on. When he does that, there's something that goes to a whole other place. And I got a feeling that as time goes on, the Lord is going to say to us, now I'm just talking to us now. I'm not talking to the camera and to the millions of people that's going to be watching this. <laughs> there will come a time when the Lord will say, I really want to do something further with you, but it will require you to have oil. And that will cost you something.
And I'll be quite honest, I don't know completely what it will cost. You see, what used to be a price for me is no price no more. It's a lifestyle. But he'll still send me a charge ticket for something completely different. And God's, God's hand is on some of you in some of the most crazy ways. And you're just like me preaching this morning. You don't totally even understand what you're saying. I don't know how this theologically flushes out, but it feels right to say, so let's just go for it and see how it works. I just know this. I know that doing church and having five virgins that are all in, five that aren't, and carrying on, I just feel the Lord saying, I really want to come, and I will keep coming. I will repeat my coming until finally you have come to the place where there is sufficient oil until there's a sufficient anointing. And I, we don't ever know what it's going to be, do we? When suddenly you're, we're sitting in a sanctuary and suddenly there's this feeling like, I know the Lord wants to heal people. So you expect the charismatic healing line. You want somebody to be the hot nut of the show, like the, the star, the superstar, and take my jacket off and throw it on them. And they fall down because I've sweated up and stunk it up, you know, and not because it's anointed. Seriously, we need to be delivered from that stuff. It's just junk. It's junk because God wants the oil to flow through you. No show, no big time, no go down there where Baldwin's at. You can really get some stuff down there. No, sitting right next to you and you say, I don't really know how to do that. You're perfect. Just sit with him and get the oil. And you're sitting beside somebody who physically is maimed or whatever her, hers or his situation may be. And you look to them and just simply say, would you mind if I would pray with you? Worship's going on. Or maybe I'm preaching. You do it. And when he finishes, when we go take communion, can I pray with you? And God, boom, because you're full of the oil. That's the way the kingdom works. So this morning, I need to hush. I want to invite you to do this. This, this building will not hold, and I know with kids in here, we about don't hold what we got, but this building will not hold the people that come to partake of what the Lord has for them. When? We all realize, and I know some of you, some of you old boys in here, you old guys, you let that old crusty part of you just fall. Just, just, just let the Lord just make you look like a, you don't know what in the world's going on because you don't. Just let it fall apart because you're, you are a target for him and he wants you and he wants to use you because only you can get to those people. Only you can touch their people. Only, you're the only one that can be the supernatural touch of God on some of those old codgers out there that I, they would never talk to me within a country mile, but they will you. And when you're carrying the oil, you've got something more than, why don't you come to church with me on Sunday? You got something more than that to give them. You got the living unction of God. So I'm going to invite you this morning. In our congregation, we, if you're a guest, and some years ago, the Lord impressed upon me the importance of communion. And it was a little awkward for a while, I grant, grant it, because that's always kind of a formal thing. But the more I've gone, the more I realize we're, we're right. 
Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have no part of me. Sounds a little Catholic, some of you. Go ahead, just let it sink down a little bit. It's okay. But I want to tell you right now, when you come and receive that body and that cup today, I want you to do more than just tip up and say, thank you. It's okay. I want you to go further. I want you to say thank you that I've been chosen now. I've been chosen to pay any price you have on my life because you have called me to more than just simply going to heaven when I die. I am a conduit of the kingdom while I'm here. Holy Spirit, you're the only one who can make sense out of our mess. And if there is anything that I said that was a heartbeat inside the heart of Jesus this morning, take it and impress it upon the hearts of all of us today. You're precious and I, I love you and I want to love you. I really want to love you more because you said if I love you, I'll obey you. So just cause us to fall in love with you more. We want to know you. Not just get saved by you, but to know you. And we want you to know us. So as my brothers and sisters receive you this morning, touch them. Touch them. Don't let any price be too great. No matter what you ask of them, no price is too great to have their self filled with oil and burn brightly. In Jesus' name, just stand, come down these outside rows. You stay at this altar as long as you need to. You don't have to, you don't have to come here to receive it, but you can. Stay as long as you need to. This has been Harvest Time with Pastor Bill Baldwin, brought to you by Encouraging People. For more videos and resources like this, please subscribe to this channel and go to our website at encouragingpeople.com.